Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Dave Wilson, and my sidekick, Kathy Rubin, and I are co-hosting uh, the event today. And we've got a packed uh, uh, day for you. And let me just uh, give you a quite a rundown here. We've got 10 lawyers, each spending about five minutes talking about different subjects. Kathleen Burney is going to talk about the Families First Coronavirus Response Act overview. Rich Loftus is then going to look at the FFCRA with respect to covered employers and uh, exemptions. Jeanette Ekanem is going to talk about unemployment. Liz Morning Browder is going to talk about furloughs and layoffs. Jeff Hirsch will touch on the OSHA issues. He, after all, he did write a book on OSHA. Mark Mackey is going to talk about the payroll protection program. Ali Metropolis is going to look at contracts in this time of the coronavirus. Our star Northeastern co-op student, Julia Russo, is going to talk about testing and screening, taking your temperature. Um, our newest em em employee, Sam Gates, who's a crack litigator, is going to talk about COVID and the courts. And finally, our own Pete Moser is going to wrap things up talking about uh, labor law issues. Yes, we will send out the slides to everybody. And um, if you have questions for the panelists, um, please use your chat function for that to, to put in your questions. And I want to remind everybody we will be recording the session. So without further ado, um, let's get going. And uh, we do have a little disclaimer. Uh, again, this is uh, not legal advice we're giving. This is for educational purposes. Um, and um, let's get right to it. And we'll start Before with... We get before we get right to it, I just want to let folks know, as Dave said, you can use the chat feature to send in questions, but we're going to do all of the presentations and we may respond to some of them through the chat, but we will at the, when all the presentations are done, we will go through the questions that folks sent to us in advance. People sent some excellent questions and then attend to other questions that came in through the chat. Thanks, Kath. So without further ado, let's get right to it with Kathleen. Hi, uh, Kathleen, you're, there you go. Hi, good morning. Uh, I'm starting off talking about the basics of this law, the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Uh, next slide, please. So the FFCRA, as we call it, is a, is a law that went into effect on April 1. It's a temporary law. Uh, through the end of this year, and it was enacted in order to address the um, economic impact and provide some relief to uh, workers um, impacted by COVID-19. So if you're a small or medium-sized employer with 499 employees or less, you're likely subject to this. My colleague Rich will next talk to you a little bit more about that, as well as those who are exempt from this law. And the law provides relief in two forms. It's paid leave, paid leave for emergency sick leave and paid expanded Family Medical Leave Act pay. Um, so you as an employer have certain obligations. Let's have the next slide, please. So the first step, you've probably already taken it. Um, notice was required. Typically you'd put up a poster, but um, under the circumstances of many of us working from home, you could also have done that or will need to do that right away by email, by direct mail, uh, snail mail, or by a website um, posting. Uh, next slide, please. So you as an employer have to consider the, whether your employee is eligible for two kinds of leave. The first, the emergency paid sick leave. And there are six qualifying reasons, really five reasons, why your employee could qualify. And you'll see they're listed all here. Um, the first three apply to them being sick with COVID um, or being impacted by a quarantine or isolation order. And numbers four and five relate to your employee having to care for somebody impacted by COVID or the school closure or daycare um, provider closure. Number six remains uniterated by the Department of Labor at this point. Next slide, please. So those six reasons or those five reasons for leave um, get paid at different rates. Those first three reasons related to COVID, that's, that's the right slide, um, will be paid at the average rate up to 511 per day uh, with a max of 5100. 
if your employee is caring for somebody subject to quarantine order or sick with COVID, or they're home for childcare or school closure reasons, they'll get two thirds of their average regular rate up to 200 per day, up to 2000 in paid sick leave. Next slide, please. So the sick leave is a two week uh, period. If your employee is full time, they'll get paid uh, 40, they'll get paid 80 hours of the sick leave and your regularly scheduled part time employee will get whatever their regular schedule is for that two weeks. If you have an employee, and this applies to both sick leave and FMLA, with an irregular schedule, you'll need to consult the, um, the regulations and the DOL, frequently asked questions, currently up to number 93 at this point, provide some really good detail about how you'll go about do that. You as an employer, you're going to get dollar for dollar reimbursement for payment of either sick leave or family medical leave under this act. Next slide, please. So the EFMLA, essentially it amends the Family and Medical Leave Act, and this applies to your employee who has worked for you for 30 days. Your employee on day one is qualified if they meet, meet the other reasons for the sick leave, but they have a 30-day requirement for this particular type of leave. And the EFMLEA provides your employee with up to 12 weeks of job-protected leave paid, at that two thirds amount, up to $200 a day, up to 12,000 over the course of 12 weeks. Um, this will only be given this type of leave for that qualifying reason number five. If your employee's school, um, children's school is closed or their child care provider is unavailable due to COVID-19 related reasons. Um, next slide, please. So, just like regular FMLA, your employee who goes out on EFMLEA will be protected and you'll need to reinstate them to their job. However, if they would be subject to a layoff or would have been subjected to a furlough, irrespective of that leave, you do not have to reinstate them. We do recommend that you discuss that with counsel, but you do have that option. And there are some exemptions or reasons why one, um, would not be entitled to EFMLA, a key employee and for smaller employers. Next slide, please. So this is an important one. We've gotten a lot of questions about this. Um, an employee who's been placed on furlough or an employee who has been laid off um, is not subject or not, does not qualify for um, either sick leave or EFMLA. And that's even if they, the reason being is an underlying COVID-19 reason. They have to be available to work. And if your business is closed, they're not available to work. And if, of course, you've laid them off or furloughed, they're not available to work. Next slide, please. So you as an employer, um, it's very important for your purposes, for purposes of the tax credit under the IRS, that you um, get the accurate documentation. The IRS says that you don't have to provide leave without uh, the employee having provided you with adequate documentation. Now, luckily for you, our HRW FFCRA leave request form does a really good job of laying out everything that you'll need to get from your employer, uh, excuse me, from your employee for purposes of the leave. As you'd imagine, it's got the basics, what their name is, what when they wanna take the leave, what type of leave they'd like to take. Um, next slide, please. And then you'll see that the type of documentation that they'll provide you or the reasons behind the documentation will be based on what the reason for their leave is. If you look at, for example, qualifying reason number two, healthcare provider recommendation, it, it requires them to provide you with the name of that healthcare care provider and their title. You'll see that it doesn't actually require them to give you a doctor's note per se. And you see the full list there and it's on our form um, and you'll want to retain that documentation for four years for IRS um, documentation and credit purposes. Next slide. Well, that's basically it on that. Um, my colleague Rich is going to talk about some of the reasons why someone wouldn't be um, eligible for FFCRA. Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Rich Loftus, and uh, I'm going to be talking to you about one of the main questions that we often get, which is who exactly is covered by the Families First Coronavirus, I'm sorry, the Families First Coronavirus Relief Act. 
And the basic rule is the FFCRA applies to the employers with fewer than 500 employees. And that determination is made at the time that the employee's leave is to be taken. And that means that if your workforce is fluctuating up and down due to various reasons, uh, it might actually be possible that sometimes when people request leave, that they will be able to take FFCRE leave because you are subject to it. And others might request leave and you might be over 500 employees and therefore you would not be subject to FFCRA. It's always determined at the time that the leave is requested. And <clears throat> when you're counting the employees, you're going to only count any employees that are located within the United States. If you have employees who are located outside of the United States, then they will not count towards that 500 employee threshold. Uh, slide, please. Now the count is going to include your full and part-time employees, employees on leave, temporary employees jointly employed by one entity and another entity, and the employee will count for both, regardless of whose payroll they're on, and day laborers supplied by a temp agency. And again, that's regardless of whether the employer is the temp agency or the client firm. Now, this is an important point too. Independent contractors uh, under the Fair Labor Standards Act are not counted. And it's important to note that that's the federal test, not the state test under Massachusetts law, which is a lot more strict as to who you can classify as an independent contractor. So independent contractors under federal law do not get counted. Slide, please. So typically, any separate company is considered to be a separate employer and all of their employees are added towards that 500 employee threshold. But there are two types of uh, exceptions to that rule. First, there's what's called the, uh, the joint employer exception. Um, and that applies even if a corporation has an ownership interest in another corporation. Uh, typically, they'd be considered separate employers unless they meet this very fact-intensive test under the Fair Labor Standards Act of whether they are considered joint employers. And typically that involves um, joint control over a particular employee. Uh, slide please. If two companies are considered joint employers of a particular employee, then the common employees, the ones that they are joint employers of, will count towards the 500 employee threshold for each employer. So if there are two separate employers that are joint employers of 50 employees, 50 will count towards one and 50 will count towards another. Now there's the additional exception to this uh, normal rule that separate companies are separate employers and that's the integrated employer test which applies under the Family and Medical Leave Act. If that test applies, then all of the employees of the integrated employers are added together. And the factors that are relevant to that are the degree of common management the interrelation between operations, whether there's centralized control of labor relations, and the degree of common ownership or financial control. So that means you might have an instance where uh, one person owns two separate companies, they're managed through the same uh, management, there's integrated operations and integrated labor controls. That means that you take the employees of both companies and add them together for the purposes of this 500 employee threshold. Slide, please. Now there are three exemptions from paid FFCRA leave. Uh, one is for healthcare provider employees. Two is for emergency responder employees. And those two are based on the employer's choice. They can choose to exempt people. Uh, we encourage that there be you know, consistency in the way you apply exemptions for many different reasons, uh, which I'm happy to discuss with you offline. Uh, but there's also a third exemption, which is for small businesses with fewer than 50 employees, where the compliance with the FFCRA would jeopardize the viability of the business as a going concern. Uh, that's only available for FFCRA leave related to lack of childcare. Now, we haven't seen too many folks try to exert this exemption and we're wondering if it might be an uphill battle to uh, establish that it will in fact jeopardize the viability of the business as a going concern. 
Uh, so to certainly exercise caution before you uh, assert that exemption. Slide, please. One exemption that I want to talk about briefly is the healthcare provider exemption. That includes specific professions at any employer. So any doctor or any nurse that's employed by anybody can be exempted from the FFCRA. But it also includes anybody employed by certain uh, institutions, employers, or entities that are listed or similar to a particular listing of healthcare employers, including doctor's offices, hospitals, healthcare centers, um, nursing facilities, retirement facilities, nursing homes, things like that. There's also an exemption for folks who have been designated by the governor as medical uh, providers, which includes direct care staff at human services organizations. Slide, please. So thank you very much. Hopefully that's helped uh, illuminate some of the uh, requirements as to employer coverage under the FFCRA. Good morning. My name is Jeanette Ekanem, and today I'm going to discuss the unemployment insurance system and how the global impact of COVID-19 has uh, actually changed the system. But first, I'll discuss the general eligibility requirements for unemployment insurance in Massachusetts. Typically, generally speaking, you must be unemployed or working significantly reduced hours through no fault of your own. You must have earned at least $5,100 within the last four calendar quarters. You must be legally authorized to work within the United States, which includes non-citizens who have work authorization, and you must be able and willing to be available for suitable work. Next slide, please. Now, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the emergency regulations that the Commonwealth issued have significantly impacted and relaxed the eligibility criteria for unemployment insurance. Typically, to be eligible for unemployment insurance, um, while you're collecting unemployment insurance, an employee must certify every week that they are actively searching for work. Due to the new regulations, for employees who are on furlough, those employees do not actually have to actively search for work. The Department of Unemployment Assistance has completely waived the work search requirements for those employees. And the only requirement is that those employees remain in touch with their employer um, and so that they can be available for work if called to do work. And this is what's considered as being on standby status. Now, what actually happens if you have work for your employee? Many employers are asking the question, uh, I have work for my employee, but my employee is actually rejecting work. And the answer to that question is, it really depends. Um, due to the emergency regulations, if you have an employee who has been asked to isolate one by the employer, um, a local government official, or a healthcare provider, and that person has um, a underlying health condition where working could pose a substantial risk to their health and safety, that person may actually be able to reject work and still collect unemployment insurance. So for example, if you have an employee who has asthma and that employee works with or near the public, um, this is an instance in which that employee might have a justifiable reason for rejecting work. Also, under the new regulations, there is a sense that the Department of Unemployment Assistance isn't heavily scrutinizing um, you know, the claims that are coming through. But even with that said, as an employer, it's very important to make sure that you are not making any representations to your employee and saying that they'll definitely receive unemployment compensation um, because ultimately that is up to the Department of Unemployment Assistance and every claim for unemployment uh, assistance is a, a fact-specific inquiry. Next slide. In addition to the relaxed Massachusetts eligibility requirements, 
The federal legislation, CARES Act, has also impacted um, unemployment insurance eligibility in three main ways. The federal pandemic unemployment compensation, which is perhaps the most well known, provides an additional $600 per week to all individuals collecting unemployment insurance. The pandemic unemployment assistance provides compensation to people who are not able to work due to a COVID-19 related reason and who traditionally have not been able to uh, be eligible for unemployment assistance. So this includes people that are self-employed, gig economy workers, um, people who have, uh, do not have sufficient work history, people who have worked um, in religious institutions. And the third major change is the pandemic emergency unemployment compensation. And that has added an additional 13 weeks of unemployment compensation for any individuals receiving UI. And so now in Massachusetts, the total number of weeks of unemployment insurance that people can have is now 39. And so with that said, there is definitely a sense, um, a worry amongst a lot of employers that people are now saying, well, you know, I can receive more money on unemployment insurance than I can working. And what do I do if now my employee is rejecting work? And the Department of Unemployment Assistance has issued guidance that if uh, you have an employee who is rejecting work because they can receive more work on unemployment insurance or more earnings on unemployment insurance, or if they're rejecting work simply because they're, they're refusing to work and they do not have an underlying health issue, the Department of Unemployment Assistance might actually uh, disqualify that person from receiving unemployment benefits altogether. And this could actually be considered fraud. Next slide. I'll speak briefly and finally about the WorkShare program. Um, so the WorkShare program can be an alternative to layoffs and, and furloughs. Essentially, if you're an employer and you have some work for employees, but not enough work for them to work their full um, regular scheduled hours, this is an opportunity to um, allow people to work reduced wages and the Department of Unemployment Assistance actually supplements the wages that the employee would have otherwise received. You must have at least two employees on the work share plan and you must place people on the work share plan, plan within the same job category. Um, so for example, if you have four accountants working for uh, your company, you have to place all accountants on the work share plan or you can put your entire company, your entire work workforce on the plan. Thank you, that's all I have. Good morning. Erin, I'll start on the next slide, please. Thank you. So COVID-19 is obviously impacting every aspect of daily life and employers are weighing various options for how to respond to this unprecedented situation. There's no one size fits all and the bottom line is that employers are facing tough choices right now. One of the options that's available is furloughing employees, and that's what I'll be covering this morning. Next slide, please. So what is a furlough? Well, a furlough is essentially an unpaid involuntary leave of absence. So it's different from a layoff, which is a typical separation from employment, because in a furlough situation, the employer maintains some of the employment relationship with the employee. So for example, the employee may remain on the employer's health insurance, and when an employee is furloughed, the employer does not need to pay out all accrued time at that point, as long as the employee is still on their benefits. Um, it's different than a temporary layoff where there is, again, a separation from employment with an intent to rehire because the employment relationship continues. And in a furlough situation, it's often um, preferable for the employee to a layoff because it's gentler. The message is, we don't have work for you to do right now, so we're sending you home without work but we're gonna remain in touch with you. You can stay on your health insurance. And our hope and intention is that when we have more work to do, we hope to be able to bring you back. Um, a furlough is different than a reduction in hours because the employee is being told not to do any work during the furlough. And it's different from a leave of absence because a leave of absence under FMLA or under the new FFCRA requires qualifying reasons. 
versus a furlough, which is an economic staffing decision. And the employer is going to make a decision about which employees to furlough based on its business needs. Next slide, please, Aaron. Next slide, please, Aaron. Thanks. So how much notice is required? Well, in Massachusetts, there's no notice requirement, though you can't have an employee show up for work and send them home without paying them. There's a reporting pay obligation, so you would need to pay them at least three hours. But even though there's no formal notice requirement, best practice is to provide employees with as much notice as possible before you determine you need to furlough them. And I'm gonna just flag the issue and not go into great depth, but on a case-by-case -case basis, we would also consider whether the WARN Act or any state plant closing laws apply. Um, however, the WARN Act is only going to apply if you have more than 100 full-time employees, and it does not apply to shorter um, furloughs. So if it's less than six months, and we all hope that the COVID-19 situation is really going to change in the next six months, um, but if it's a furlough of less than six months, WARN wouldn't apply, and there are also another exemptions to warn notice requirements, including the unforeseeable business circumstances exemption. Next slide, please. So here is an outline of a furlough letter. I'm not gonna go into much detail, but hopefully this is a useful resource to you if you determine that you need to furlough some of your employees. All right, so some of the frequently asked questions around furloughs. So do you need to continue healthcare? Well, the answer is yes. And this is one of the benefits to an employee of being furloughed versus being laid off is that they can continue with their health insurance benefits, which are often more affordable than them going on COBRA. In terms of duration, you want to check with your broker about duration and about any other limitations. But in general, we're hearing from clients that insurers are being very accommodating and generous with keeping furloughed employees on their health insurance during this time. Next slide, please, Erin. So vacation. So again, the, the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office has come out with an answer to this frequently asked question. If it's a true furlough situation and there's a continuation of the employee relationship such that the employee is remaining on health insurance benefits, then the furlough is not, continued, not considered a discharge for purposes of the Wage Act and the employer does not need to pay out the accrued time at the time of furlough. However, at some point during the furlough, the employer becomes unable to continue contributing to the employee's benefits. That, at that point, the employer would need to pay out any accrued time. Next slide, please. Families First Coronavirus Response Act. This was covered. Um, this is, uh, a furloughed employee is not going to be eligible for these benefits because a furloughed employee is furloughed because there is not work for them to do. And to be eligible for FFCRA benefits, there needs to be work and it needs to be that the employee is unable to perform the work due to a COVID-19 qualifying reason. Next slide, please. So what happens if a furloughed employee ends up performing some work while they're on furlough? Well, they need to be paid if they end up working. And so for an hourly employee, you would pay them. If they're a salaried employee and they end up working during the furlough, including checking work emails, you would need to pay them their entire week's salary. So it's important upfront for an employer to communicate with an employee if they're furloughing them about what the expectations are and to provide clear instructions that the employee is not to work while on furlough. Next slide, please. Some employers may opt to reduce um, employees' hours rather than furloughing them. So in that case, if it is an hourly employee where you're reducing their hours, you just want to make sure that you're giving them as much notice as possible and that you're paying them at least minimum wage and that there's a reporting pay obligation. If you call them in, you can't send them home without any pay. You need to pay them for at least three hours. Now, if they're a salaried employee, you cannot... Um, redu temporarily reduce their salary because that would threaten the overtime exemption. So to maintain the overtime exemption, you're going to need to pay them at least $684 a week, regardless of the quantity and quality of work they perform. So if you're going to reduce the pay and the hours of a salaried employee, you want to make that change at the beginning of a work week, you want to give them as much notice as possible. And rather than reducing their current salary, you're going to give them either a new reduced salary. So say starting next week, your weekly salary will be X, or you may opt to change them over to an hourly pay. Next slide, please. So return to work, there's a lot of buzz about this. There's evolving um, information coming out every day. Just want to flag a few things at a high level. So the Department of Unemployment 
assure, um, the Department of Unemployment's regulations that expanded unemployment to those who are on standby status or furloughed, those regulations are set to expire on June 14th. Um, as Jeanette mentioned, DUA has issued answers to frequently asked questions, including what happens if an employer has temporarily laid off an employee and then chooses to call back its employees and the employee opts not to return to work even though work is offered. Is that employee eligible for unemployment? The answer, it depends. If the reason for not returning to work is because the employee was making more money on unemployment, receiving a greater benefit being on unemployment, and they opt not to return to work, they won't be eligible for unemployment. However, if that employee is opting not to return to work, even though work is offered, and the reason is because of a COVID-19 related reason or an underlying health condition, they may continue to be eligible for unemployment. So again, there's evolving guidance in the return to work area. So um, please feel free to consult with us as you're planning for that. And that's all I have on furloughs. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I get to talk a little bit about OSHA, health and safety. And I'd like to play a little bit of reminding everyone about this book called Where's Waldo? Remember Where's Waldo when you were, when you were talking with kids or grandchildren? Look at the picture we have put up right here. And where's the Waldo here? Look at this lack of social distancing, no masks on these guys. But we put this in here to, to raise that issue and make sure that we are all gonna be doing this when we get back uh, online. All right, let's have the next slide, please. So OSHA has a number of publications that are out. They're very detailed and very helpful. And the best thing for you to do is to go online and actually look at them. And the, web, the websites are right there. There's uh, guidance on preparing workplaces for the, the virus. There's OSHA updates and there's interim guidance. All three of those are on the slide and they'll be given out uh, later. So next slide, please. So uh, OSHA has something called the general duty clause. And if anyone knows uh, or has had any experience re relating to the Occupational Safety and Health Act of 1970, which is celebrating its 50th year this year, by the way, uh, you know that they've got thousands of pages of regulations, what they call standards. And they deal with everything from, from this situation that's pictured here, actually walking and working surfaces has special regulations. Uh, so this person who fell would be covered by one of those regulations, not the general duty clause. In situations when there are regulations that do not apply, there's nothing like ergonomics as an example. And COVID-19 is a good example. We have the general duty clause. And you can see the language of the general duty clause uh, on the slide. This was written again back in 1970 by Congress. We have a duty to maintain a workplace free from recognized hazards that could be causing death or serious physical uh, harm to employees. So this is what we call in our business the catch-all. If there's no regulation to address a safety hazard in the workplace, then what OSHA does will re it'll resort to the general duty clause, which is what we call section 5A1. So just be aware of that. And that will, that duty of, the burden that OSHA has in proving violations under the, the general duty clause is a significant burden because they have to establish first that it's a recognized hazard. It could cause death or serious injury. So just be aware of that. Uh, and uh, of course, obviously if you have any questions, you can uh, consult us. Next slide, please. So refusing to work uh, during the pandemic. Uh, next slide, please. So this is very important. We're getting lots of questions about, about these issues uh, coming up as we anticipate gradual reopenings. And as you see the governor's announcement yesterday and then watch the news and see all over the country, states opening up with restaurants and beauty salons and barbershops and movie theaters and golf courses. So. The general rule in our world is that employees have very limited rights to refuse to work uh, because of safety and health concerns. There have to be uh, an imminent danger and the factors are summarized right there on the slide. Uh, the employee uh, has asked the employer uh, about, about the situation. The employee generally believes that a, an imminent danger exists uh, and that the famous reasonable person standard for any lawyers in the audience. We learned in law school about the reasonable person. That is a reasonable person. That's a, a fictitious person 
who has ordinary sensibilities, common sense, the average uh, person on the street. And that the, uh, the last item here is that the regular enforcement channels aren't sufficient so that there aren't enough uh, approaches for the employee to uh, register his, his or her concern. Next slide, please. So what's imminent danger? It really, it really means the threat of death or serious physical harm. It cannot be a general fear. Oh my gosh, I've seen so much about this on television. I've seen the, the ambulances. I've seen all the terrible impact that COVID-19 has had, and I'm afraid to go to work. They have to be uh, very specific facts. There have to be imminent uh, threat of death or serious physical harm. And this issue really is fact specific. So uh, you really would need to assess each situation on its own merits and uh, do not be afraid to seek advice. These are areas where we're developing uh, with this, with this virus and our responses to it. We want to re always remember to be a sensitive, caring, and thoughtful employer for all other good reasons, as you know. Okay, next slide, please. And that's my finish of my cameo appearance. Good job, Jeff, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name's Mark Mackey. I'm gonna be talking about the Payroll Protection Program. So the Payroll Protection Program, or the PPP, was enacted as part of the CARES Act to offer SBA loans to businesses with 500 or less employees. Eligible recipients can receive loans in an amount equal to two and a half times their payroll costs, up to $10 million, and may qualify to have part or all of their loan forgiven. So what I'll be doing today is briefly going through some of the questions we've received regarding the PPP. Um, so this first one, what can I use PPP funds, funds for? The CARES Act expressly provides what these PPP loans can be used for. Uh, next slide, please. As you can see in this slide in front of you, uh, we have a list of the allowable uses for PPP funds and the allowable uses for PPP funds, which will be eligible for loan forgiveness. So for generally the allowable uses, we have payroll costs, rent, interest on certain debt obligations, among the other included categories. Uh, for forgiveness purposes, the categories of spending are more limited. So we have payroll costs. We have payments of interest on any covered mortgage obligation, which is a mortgage on real or personal property incurred before February 15th, 2020. Uh, for covered rent obligations, uh, that includes a lease in force before February 15th, 2020. Uh, and then covered utility payments include payments for electricity, gas, water, transportation, telephone, or internet access for which service began before February 15th, 2020. Uh, next slide, please. And there are additional restrictions on the use of PPP loans. So the SBA published several final rules, including one that requires that, excuse me, the SBA is the Small Business Administration. They published several final rules, including one that requires that at least 75% of PPP funds be used for payroll costs and not more than 25% of the amount that is eligible to be forgiven may be used for non-payroll costs. Next slide, please. Are taxes included in the calculation of payroll costs? Um, so next slide. The, the SBA has clarified that the employer's share of federal payroll taxes, such as FICA and federal income taxes, are excluded from payroll costs. Uh, companies should keep this in mind when it comes to the use of the PPP loan funds and you know, what they'll be eligible for for loan forgiveness. Uh, state and local taxes assessed on compensation are expressly included in the definition of payroll costs. Next slide. So one question we had is, uh, what if I misuse PPP funds? Well, if you misuse PPP funds, you will have to repay the misused amounts. And if you knowingly misuse the funds, you may be subject to charges for fraud. So don't go out and buy a boat for yourself when that PPP money hits the bank account. Only use it for the purposes we mentioned earlier. Uh, next slide. Uh, will my loan forgiveness be reduced? So this is a big one. Uh, companies are eligible for forgiveness of the amount of PPP loan spent 
on eligible uses, as you know, I described earlier, during the eight week period beginning on the date of the origination of the loan. So what you see here is a breakdown of the ways in which your loan may be reduced, either due to a reduction in the number of full-time equivalent employees or reductions in wages of certain employees. Uh, for a reduction in employees, uh, most employers are going to be, uh, excuse me, to determine the loan reduction or the forgiveness reduction amount with respect to a reduction in employees, most employers are going to be multiplying their loan amount by the number you get by dividing the average number of full-time equivalent employees per month for the eight week period on the date of loan origination by the lower of the average number of full-time equivalent employees between February 15th and June 30th, 2019, or January 1st and February 29th, 2020. And that's that first equation that we have up here when we're talking about reduction based on reduction in number of employees. And if you can, and as I mentioned, you can see the option one and option two, you're gonna to wanna to use the lower number when you're doing that equation uh, to come out to determine how much your loan may be reduced if you have a reduction in employees. Uh, next slide, please. Is there any way to restore the amount of my loan forgiveness if I have laid off employees or reduced employees' salaries or wages? Uh, next slide. So loan forgiveness can be restored with respect to layoffs or salary reductions that occurred between February 15th and April 26th of this year. And that's if the reductions and layoffs are eliminated by June 30th of this year. Uh, next slide. Will my loan forgiveness amount be reduced if I laid off an employee, offered to rehire the same employee, but the employee declined the offer? Uh, so one area of clarity provided by recent SBA guidance is this situation many employers have been facing. They laid someone off, the employer received a PPP loan and recalls the employee, and the employee declines the recall offer for whatever reason. Employers have been concerned that despite their best efforts, they're gonna have their forgiveness amount reduced because of this situation. Well, the SBA has made clear in recent guidance that laid off employees that the employer tried to rehire for the same hours and wages will not be included in loan forgiveness reduction calculation. Uh, we're waiting on, on further guidance from the SBA regarding loan forgiveness and how the mechanics of this will actually work. Uh, but for now, to ensure you qualify for this exception, if you offer to rehire a laid off employee, be sure to do it in writing. And if the employee rejects your offer, be sure to document that rejection. Um, so that's all I have on the PPP loan for now. If you have any further questions, I know that was a lot, please reach out to me. Um, and we're gonna turn it over to Allie Metropolis to discuss contracts in the time of COVID. Hey everyone, um, thanks so much for joining. I'm gonna go through some uh, cost saving considerations and um, contract defenses. Aaron, can you go to the next slide? Thanks, so as I said, we're gonna do options for cost savings, um, force majeure and other defenses if people are being difficult about terminating your contracts. And then I'm gonna quickly go over some e-notary options that have recently come down from um, our governor. Next slide. All right, so some cost saving options that you might want to consider um, if you in addition to um, furloughing your employees and getting your PPP loan if you're struggling because COVID has really impacted your industry, which many of you have take an inventory. Um, and review all of your third party contracts and agreements, um, there may be some out there that are you know annual contracts that just renew automatically that you may be able to terminate or get out of or put a pause on. Um, so, but it all is regarding trimming that fat. Do you really need it? What is feasible? What is not feasible? Can you get out of something quickly? Um, we'll get into, as I said, we'll get into the contract defenses soon, um, but take a look at the contract term and consider whether you should attempt to terminate it or just put a pause. So looking at that, when does your contract term end? Um, what are the terms for termination? Can you, ter can you terminate with 30 days notice? Can you terminate without any notice? Can you not terminate at all? Um, is there a provision allowing for delay in performance um, on either party? 
is there a relationship? Do you have a pre-existing relationship with your vendors? Are you guys friends? Do you guys do business together all the time? That's going to make a big difference for you. Um, is this a specific project that can be picked up later that doesn't need to be done right now? Um, and is it critical for your current operations? Um, your ability to hit pause on a contract or to terminate that contract may be impacted by the type of contract it is. So if it's a real estate agreement, you you know, you're trying to either a lease or you're buying property. Um, those are almost always strict performance. So there's unlikely any way for you to get out easily or to get a, um, a refund back on any deposit you've put in place. Um, but event contracts, for example, um, often have delay or termination provisions due to emergencies or other um, similar reasons. And they too may be having issues that prevent them from fulfilling their end of the contract. Um, so, you know, if, if you are trying to get out of your contract, I think the most practical advice I can give is, you know, before you get your lawyer involved, before you get, um, you know, you start writing an angry letter that you want to terminate, talk to your vendor. You know, I think the the most important thing about this COVID situation is we're all in the same boat here. So vendors, like I said before, are also likely struggling. They may not be able to fulfill the end of their of the contract with you either. So especially if you have a longstanding relationship with a vendor, um, the converse, uh, had just having a conversation, reaching out, can often get you to a much quicker, much better resolution um, for everybody involved rather than putting a, um, then, you know, getting litigious about it. Um, so in that vein, work together with your vendors to consider creative solutions. Um, uh, can you do a credit instead of a reimbursement for prepaid amounts? Can you defer fees for a while? I know a lot of people are doing that. Um, can you just hit pause and take this project up in September, October, November? Um, rather than terminating completely. If you had an event that was scheduled for March, April, May, June, can you move it to next year or to later this year when things may be um, opened up more? All right, next slide, Erin. All right, in the event that people, you can't terminate, you can't hit pause on the contract under its terms and initial conversations with your vendors um, aren't really getting you anywhere, um, contracts, and your, the contract itself and common law may provide you with some options. Um, I'd note, however, that you should not rely on these equitable defenses or the defenses that you find in, um, in common law. It's really better to work out a solution than to rely on a court. Um, and, but the, the benefit of, have, of knowing about these is that it can give you a better bargaining chip at the table. Um, so, Force majeure, I think, is the one that people have been talking about the most. Um, it's most often seen as the kind of act of God um, emergency clause that's in many, many agreements, but is never, nobody's ever fought about. Um, I've, I've revised more force majeure clauses than I've ever had in my, um, you know, career to date. So, you know, they, what a force majeure addresses in theory is the the fact that you you can hit pause or terminate a contract if there's unforeseeable circumstances such as acts of gods riots wars um, and this is, seems like a great option here because this is obviously a completely unforeseen circumstance um, in reality i would note that the clause the, you, you have there has to be a couple of pieces here in place for you to be able to to use that force majeure clause. It has to be in the contract for one. Um, and even if it's in the contract, it has to specifically apply to the performance at issue. So you really need a pretty specific um, uh, directive towards um, pandemics in order for this to be able to really be used. Um, courts tend to construe force majeure clauses super narrowly and only if it's truly unforeseeable and specifically covered by the contract. Um, so just keep that in mind when, if you, you know, it, it's not a completely jail, get out of jail free clause. Um, impracticability and impossibility are, um, of performance are also, um, 
options under common law. So it probably won't be directly in your contract. Um, but it basically excuses performance if there are um, unforeseeable circumstances occurring after the contract was made. Um, but it can't include, you have to really review your contract carefully um, for any references to these excuses. Um, if the contract includes a term that allocates the risks associated with a global crisis, for example, um, then the contract term is going to control rather than uh, an impossibility or impracticability argument under common law. Um, so keep those things in mind. They can, keep, they can give you bargaining chips at the table, but like I said in the earlier slide, talk to your vendors. That's going to be your best option. Um, next slide. All right, so notary options under COVID. I know that um, a lot of people have been struggling with what do I do? How do I get a notary? Everything's closed. Um, the governor recently um, allowed for a remote, no the assigned the Remote no no Notarization Act, um, a note that it expires for three days after the end of uh, an emergency. So it may expire next Wednesday. <laughs> Um, depending on how the governor is defining the end of this emergency. Um, it's also, I will note, not very uh, practical. Um, notaries have to all be physically present in Mass and signatories have to be all present in Massachusetts. Uh, the signer um, has to disclose anybody that's present in the room with them. You do a video, essentially the way it works is you do a video conference, people um, the signer will sign whatever the document is, the notary will watch them sign it. You then have to send, the, the signer then has to send the document to the notary. If it's a real estate document, you then have to get on video chat again to confirm that that was a document that was sent. You, the notary then notarizes it and then it can go wherever it's supposed to go. Um, so not exactly practical. Um, so if you can wait a little bit or do a um, and in person, but um, social distance uh, notary option that may be slightly better. Um, I'll also note that um, this is a this is very different than in person notarization, um, which allows you to affirm or acknowledge your signature um, to the notary after the fact. You have the notary will, is going to have to watch you actually sign it. Um, all right, so that's all for me on contracts and notaries. I think Julia is going to talk next about temperature taking and screening in the workplace. Hi, everyone. My name is Julia Russo. Uh, as Ali said, I'm going to be talking about temperature checks and screening in the workplace for those of you that are reopening or thinking about reopening. Next slide, please. Um, so the short answer here is that yes, employers may take the temperature of their employees. In fact, some may even be required to do so. This will depend on what state you are in and the guidance that your governor has given and potentially what industry you work in. Um, so there might be different answers for those attendees and you might have to um, research a little bit more on your requirements. But as far as what you may do, there are three areas of potential liability to just keep in mind. Those would be a breach of confidentiality, um, any discriminatory practices in screening and a failure to use the information derived from the screening appropriately. And also just employers should be aware that some persons who do not have a fever may still have COVID and vice versa. So the results of temperature checks should maybe lead to a further conversation in the future. Next slide, please, Aaron. So the bottom line is that sick employees should stay home and not enter the workplace. Anybody with a temperature above 100 degrees is considered to have a fever and or if they are uh, visibly presenting symptoms of COVID, such as a cough, shortness of breath, there are many other symptoms that are constantly evolving. So just be mindful of um, anything that public health authorities come forward with as far as symptoms. Um, and also always be protective of employee privacy. So you may notify coworkers if they were exposed to someone who an employee has tested positive for COVID, 
otherwise never release the names of employees and just be very mindful of confidentiality. Next slide, please, Erin. So when can an employee that was sick safely return to work? So the CDC has set forth guidelines, which are footnoted at the bottom of this slide. Um, and I noted here the symptom-based strategy. So an employee has to meet all three of these criteria before returning to work. No fever for three days without the use of fever reducing medication. Respiratory symptoms have improved for three days and at least 10 days have passed since, since symptoms first appeared. Um, as far as requiring a doctor's note for fitness for duty, employers may do that. Um, however, the EEOC has noted that for practical reasons, it might be better for employers to take more flexible measures, for example, relying on local clinics or some type of stamp or form certifying that an employee no longer has COVID. Um, but the bottom line is definitely to be flexible, and obviously these are very uncertain times, so that's an important thing to keep in mind. Next slide, please. Who should be conducting these temperature checks? So if you have it done at the workplace, the administrator should be a designated person that is properly trained on all of the procedures and is mindful of confidentiality. Um, as if it is at the workplace as well, that administrator should be treated as working in a high or very high exposure risk according to OSHA guidelines. Therefore, they should always wear PPE, proper protect, protective equipment, such as a mask, gloves, gown, better safe than sorry, I would say, because these people could be coming into close contact with persons that could be COVID positive. Um, so another option is to have employees do self temperature checks before they come to work. I know that Governor Baker has issued guidance for retail establishments um, right now that actually mandates those employees to do a self check. Just be mindful that um, it could be harder to keep track of test results if employees are doing them themselves. So it's an option that you could do, but just be mindful that it could be more reliable to conduct them all at the same place at the same time. Next slide, please, Erin. What procedures should be followed? So there should always be readily available hand hygiene facilities, a sink or soap and water um, or hand sanitizer, especially for the person conducting the um, temperature checks. There should be social distancing in the lines for temperature checks, so each person six feet apart. Um, there should also be, if it is feasible for employers to get minimally invasive devices, such as forehead thermometers, thermo scanners, those are definitely preferred because it is just more practical and less awkward in general, but um, also just to always keep temperature check sites sanitized and disinfected after each use. So all of these sanitation and um, hygiene policies should be at place in the workplace altogether, but even more so at the site where temperature checks are conducted. Next slide, please, Erin. So we recommend that employers maintain a log of the daily temperature checks. This is important for two reasons. One, for any potential liability in the future, employers can say that they acted reasonably, they properly uh, maintained these records, that also need to be confident, confidential. So the results of these temperature checks or any other medical information should not be kept in an employee's personnel file. They should be kept separately and should have limited access to them. Um, and as other, another potential liability reason is to say that you recorded the temperature checks, you discussed with those employees appropriately, and you were doing your utmost to keep the workplace safe. Next slide, please, Erin. Um, that's all from me. And next up is Sam Gates talking about coronavirus and the courts. Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Sam Gates, and I have a litigation practice focusing on business and employment disputes. And among the many, many questions we've been receiving from our clients these days is, what's going on with the courts? Uh, next slide, please. 
It's a good question to ask because whether you're a party to a pending lawsuit or whether litigation may be on the horizon for your business, it's important to at least have a basic understanding of how the courts are functioning. So I'm just going to cover some of the basic nuts and bolts of how the courts are operating. And then I'll also briefly discuss just a, a few words of wisdom for litigants in the current climate. Uh, next slide, please. The Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court has been issuing periodic standing orders with respect to the coronavirus. And the current order became effective on May 4th. As you can see, under the current order, courts are conducting business, but they're physically closed to the public except for so-called emergency matters. Um, now, I'll discuss this a little bit more later, but keep in mind that what the courts consider to be emergency matters is much more limited than what we're used to. And unless your issue or motion slots into one of a few very particular categories, it's really not likely to be considered an emergency. For the time being, emergencies are mostly limited to criminal matters and some civil matters involving personal liberties and protections. Now, the Massachusetts courts are claiming to attempt to address non-emergency matters virtually by way of conference call or video conference. So there may be situations where a hearing will be scheduled, but again, matters are gonna be prioritized. So for example, if you have a discovery dispute in a civil matter, don't expect to be getting a telephone call from the clerk's office scheduling a hearing anytime soon. Uh, under the current order, jury trials have been continued to no earlier than July 1st, and statutes of limitations have been told. Um, deadlines, deadlines are always important, they remain so. Um, uh, under the current order, all deadlines imposed either by statute, by rule of procedure, or by the court have been extended. Now there's a formula that's laid out in the order. Um, it basically involves you doing a math problem so that you can calculate your new deadline, but essentially you can expect that if there was a looming deadline in your case, it's likely that deadline has been extended. Next slide, please. Um, now the federal courts, at least in the District of Massachusetts, are operating a bit more fluidly. They have more resources to begin with. They were better equipped to handle this crisis. Uh, if you have a motion hearing or a status conference scheduled in that court, it's much more likely that the judge is going to continue to hold that event by phone or video conference. That said, even in the federal courts, all jury trials and mediations have been continued until at least the end of the month. Uh, next slide, please. So that's the brass tacks of what's going on with the courts. Um, I'll, I'll wrap up just by passing along some words of wisdom for navigating litigation during this time. The key takeaway I think is now more than ever, you wanna be really careful with how, or maybe even if at all, you're gonna interact with the courts. Um, because even though a particular issue may seem critical to you, you may actually be doing damage to your cause by trying to push for a hearing or a ruling from a judge. Keep in mind that the system is really overwhelmed right now, mostly with criminal matters, and the court is just not going to react well to civil litigants trying to advance matters that are not truly time sensitive. So, um, for example, a few months ago, you may have been rushing into court for a pre preliminary injunction. Now today, that, that same issue is just as important to you as it was back then, but the court's not likely to view it the same way. There are plenty of anecdotes now making the rounds about litigants receiving serious tongue lashings from judges who really did not appreciate those parties overvaluing the importance of, or, or the, overvaluing the time sensitivity of their cases. So um, please think wisely before you rush into court. That being said, simple best practices for litigants still apply. Um, if you're insured, make sure to put those insurers on notice, gather documents, and last but not least, um, we would just respectfully suggest that at times like these, uh, it's more true than ever that a, that a health, healthy dose of courtesy and professionalism can go a very long way. Um, that's it for me. I'm available for questions. Feel free to contact me directly if there's anything you'd like to discuss and I'll turn it over to Pete.
All right. Thank you, Sam. Um, so my name is Pete Moser. I'm a partner here at HRW, and one of the areas of my practice focus is labor law. So I wanted to spend at least five minutes on uh, labor issues, but don't go to sleep. I know we've got some attendees on this call that are unionized. This is really, at least this first part, very much applicable to all the non-union employers out there. And so that's kind of why we put it in the program, just to make sure we talked about this. It could end up being one of the more um, relevant pieces to, to, to some workplace challenges here. So let me jump in uh, and talk about uh, protected activity under Section 7. Hey, before I do that, though, we've been getting a lot of questions on chat, and I know Kathy and Dave in particular are racing to answer all of them. We do have enough time at the end that we're going to get to focus on some, some of the greatest hits of these particular questions, so we'll do that. Um, but for the folks who have been also asking questions on the Q&A function of this, I don't think we've been getting to that. We wanted to have chat be the function. So if you've asked a question on the Q&A part of the Zoom call, um, raise it at the end or bring it over to chat because that's what we've been focused on. All right, that was my administrative uh, PSA. All right, so back to labor issues. Uh, protected activity. Uh, you can see the slide in front of you. The thing I want to focus your attention on is that second bullet. This is a part of the labor law that's been in effect since the beginning, since 1935. And when it was enacted in 1935, it was probably largely intended to to, to be the heart of the law in terms of union organizing. But if you read section seven, that second bullet, it says that employees have the right to engage in other concerted activities for their own mutual aid or protection. So that's what I wanted to spend a minute on. Employees who engage in concerted activity for their mutual aid or protection. What does that mean? Well, the federal agency that's in charge of enforcing and interpreting the labor laws, the NLRB, has taken a very, very, very broad view in recent years of what protected activity under Section 7 is. So it could come up in this coronavirus pandemic. How? What if somebody says, hey, look, we don't think it's safe to work here. I know you're trying to recall me from a furlough employer, or um, I know you, you want to end my telework arrangement and bring me back to the office, but I don't think it's safe. And I'm speaking for everybody. I'm not going to do it. So this could come up the Section 7 in the situation where an employee refuses to work or leaves work saying, I don't think this mask is effective, or you don't have enough PPE, I need gloves that you don't have or something. It, this, this section seven could come up in a refusal to work situation. So in five minutes time, we don't have uh, time to sort of walk through exactly what to do in, in several scenarios, but I want to at least flag this for you to be aware of it. If an employee is refusing to come back to work, refusing to work, um, as Kathy, I think mentioned at some point, there's probably a checklist you go through to see if, uh, what protections the employee may have. Perhaps the employee has got a medical condition. Perhaps it's covered under the FFCRA. Perhaps there's a need to accommodate a vulnerability to a susceptibility to COVID-19. At the end of this checklist might be, hey, before I come down on this employee for what I think is refusing to work, has this employee engaged in protected concerted activity? And would that be protected by the NLRB here in Boston? Because it might. So we would wanna talk about that situation. Just be aware of it. There's a way to handle these things. Um, and just so you recognize it when you see it, concerted activity, as the name implies, involves usually more than one employee. It can be expressed by one employee, but it sounds like the third bullet here, where somebody's seeking to initiate or prepare for group action, or it's a group complaint being brought to the attention of management. It sounds like the we, not the me, personal gripe. If somebody's doing that, whether it's to your face, whether it's in the process of storming out, whether it's on social media, even, even negatively talking about your, your company or services, just be aware of the Section 7. And um, obviously, give a call if you have any questions about it, because it's, it's complicated, but it can be navigated. It's just one other area of protection that in the sleepy little world of labor law may actually become more of a focus uh, as we try and bring people back to work and people are a little nervous about it. All right, next slide. To round out labor issues, uh, this one is for the unionized uh, folks in the room, and we've probably already talked about a lot of these things. Um, in the COVID-19 uh, pandemic crisis, particularly on the healthcare front lines, where you've got a collective bargaining agreement in effect, um, employers and caregivers uh, have felt the need to move pretty quickly. And needless to say, a lot of the collective bargaining agreements that were negotiated didn't contemplate a pandemic crisis. So um, there's a lot of pushback from unions about what they feel are unilateral changes being made that aren't permitted by the contract. And these are just three of the areas that a unionized employer thinks of 
when um, making a change that, that may be resisted by the union. So it may be that even though the change you're wanting to make, maybe you're implementing furloughs and the union says, our contract doesn't allow for furloughs. Or maybe you're saying, hey, look, during this pandemic crisis, we need all hands on deck. You can't take vacation during this pandemic crisis. You can't do that. The contract says I'm allowed to take vacation. Any permutation of those kind of facts can come up. And these days, fortunately, under the current NLRB makeup, there's a little more leeway for employers to act, a little bit. If the contract covers the topic, not necessarily the specific action, maybe you're allowed to act under contract coverage. Some collective bargaining agreements have a savings clause that says, hey, look, if there's a change in the law or some crisis, you know, the parties agree that, that the provisions of this contract are deemed modified in some way. Or this last one, economic exigencies, which is kind of like the Trump card, uh, no reference to the president, where an employee says, look, I know the contract says X, but I just can't do it. This unforeseen thing has happened that is urgent and compelling and has a huge financial imperative behind it that I must act now. Um, so the law recognizes that, although it's very rare. So again, we're zipping through these things quickly. I just wanted to at least, for the unionized folks in the call, identify these things. I know we've probably talked about a lot of them already and, and how we frame changes and new policies and things that the union might think are unilateral changes that we need to bargain about. They often fall within one of those buckets, our argument for things being permissible. I would pause for questions now, but we're not doing that. We're going to the end. If you've got any union questions, we'd love to hear them. But last slide I've got is the next one, Aaron. Um, so just, uh, yeah, I put the slide on there to say, hey, how has COVID-19 pandemic affected the government? The National Labor Relations Board, like other agencies, has been affected. They've closed things down. They've reopened. They're teleworking. But here's the point I want to make on the impact on the NLRB. For all the non-union folks on the line who particularly are in maybe target industries, healthcare, human services, transportation, manufacturing, folks where the union organizing risk is, is real, um, that risk remains. And, and one of my colleagues just circulated this morning in an article suggesting that in the nonprofit world, some unions are being more active now and are using this opportunity to gain members and to organize. That risk is still there. And this would be a lousy time to be in the middle of an organizing campaign. Uh, you don't wanna do it. You can't really talk to your employees in the way you normally would during a campaign. You wanna get the message out. Um, you wanna make sure employees feel heard and respected. And this is a real difficult time we're all going through because there may be many employees that aren't feeling that they're protected or respected or heard. And those are usually the, the makings for fertile ground for union organizing. So I just wanted to mention that. I mean, we're always sounding the alarm bell for employers to, to do the right thing by employees and avoid union organizing. It's still a thing out there. And I will say this, if it were to happen to an employer now, if there were a union organizing drive, it would probably end up being done by mail ballot. And you would, like I say, have a really difficult time talking to your employees. And the whole process is very quick at the moment. So the setup would not be good to have a union organizing drive during the pandemic. Things are on, on the move are changing. The last bullet on this slide talks about the NLRB actually rolling out changes to the election procedures. They were supposed to go into effect April 16th to slow the process back down to give employers a fair chance to get their message out. That's actually been delayed because of the pandemic. So if you're in that target industry, A, beware, elections are still going on and they're by mail ballot, which is not a great way to do it. And your ability to, to fight a campaign is compromised. But B, you know, if your campaign happens to happen after May 31st, you'll actually be in a better position because new rules are coming out from the NLRB. Um, in theory, they'll, they'll be challenged uh, litigation for sure. So that was a quick, fast talk through several key labor issues. I want to end there and get to the Q&As because I know we got a lot of them. So uh, that is it. Thanks, Pete. Kathy, um, do you want to uh, address a couple of the questions that we got? Yeah, we're going to start with the questions that folks emailed in in advance. You can keep the questions coming on the chat, but as they come in, then we sort of have to scroll back. So we'll just sort of do our best to grab and answer questions as they <sighs> keep them coming. So here's one that was sent in. Um, how does an employer handle an employee who is currently out on short-term disability and who's not getting wages? Their wages were included in the payroll calculation for the PPP loan. So this is one of these perfect questions that it's not suitable for a webinar because there are a lot of sub questions when you say, how do you handle the person? The first question you may be asking is, 
I put in my PPP loan and I included wages that I'm not actually paying, an STD carrier is paying them. Well, maybe you are paying them, maybe a carrier is paying them. That's, that's a question you need to review with your banker and your accountant to make sure that your loan was lawful. Then there's questions about persons on short-term disability and whether they can get FFCRA leave at the same time. Remember that FFCRA leave is a form of leave. You're unable to work and you have to certify that it's due to one of those reasons. If you're already on STD, could one of those reasons also apply? Maybe. Again, this is a fact specific inquiry. And you also have to look at the terms of your own STD plan because there's many different types of plans. So sorry to the person who posed the question, but this is a little too complicated, but it's an excellent question to be thinking about that when a person is on short-term disability. Oh, one more issue on that issue is people often ask if someone's on short-term disability, can they be furloughed? And that's the same answer that we have when before COVID, someone says, I'm doing a layoff and I've got two people on FMLA leave and two people on disability leave. If they're the only one selected for furlough, that's gonna certainly look suspicious, like their disability played a role. Furloughs should be economic decisions. And as I mentioned in the chat, you never want it to be, we're gonna furlough anybody with a compromised immune system. No, the furlough is based on availability of work. Kathy, we got another good question, which I think a lot of people are uh, wondering about, and that's, can we require an employee who simply does not want to come in at all with no COVID exposure or illness issues to come in at least a few days, especially since some restrictions will be lifted on Monday? We are considered an essential employer. To date, we've allowed this person to work remotely, but we're looking to start increasing our in-office presence. So this is an issue that uh, employers are confronting all, all over the place where uh, maybe somebody doesn't qualify for the, uh, the FFRCA, um, but they're, they're, they're nervous about coming back. And um, our message to you in these situations is to really open a dialogue with the employee and have good communication and try to figure out what the issues are, why they don't want to come in, um, and then um, each situation, as, as we know, I went to three years of law school to learn the answer to these questions is it depends. And each situation is going to be different. You may be in a situation where you just are ultimately giving them choices. You know, we have a job for you. You don't feel comfortable. Um, then here are your other choices. And one is, you know, you can continue to collect unemployment. But if unemployment asks us, we may have to tell them that we offered you a position. And, and you, you've refused. So um, our message to you as employers in these situations is communication, communication, communication. And uh, Kathy, you may have something to add to that. That, that is perfect. And um, Mark and I were working with a client the other day where it really was about sending a letter. And that letter, as Dave Wilson would say, is your get out of jail free card that says, dear employee, you were put on a furlough, you've been offered your job back, You've indicated that you don't want to come back because of this reason. That reason is not eligible for FFCRA leave, and we can't guarantee you that you're going to be able to collect unemployment. We're going to give you another chance to let us know what's going on. And bear in mind, you know, some, we've had a number of clients who've been frustrated by workers who <laughs> work, that there may be lawful reasons for their refusal to work. And they may even be eligible for regular unemployment under circumstances where they're not eligible for COVID-related unemployment. So each situation is unique. And these are, these are hard ones and the paper trail will be important. Um, all right, so that's a, not, a lot of clients, a lot of, a lot of questions on this return to work issue. Okay, um, let's see. Um, Looking for information to continue addressing employees getting called back to work and not being able to due to child care issues, even as an essential worker. So here's a real important thing to remember. Essential worker versus non-essential worker is, is deals with whether or not the business can be open. It doesn't deal with whether the person is eligible for FFCRA leave. That's a different question. Now, you may be a healthcare provider subject to the FFCRA, because you have fewer than 500 employees, but you have a legal right to exempt yourself and exempt your employees as a healthcare provider. That's a different question from essential versus non-essential. So 
Be careful not to confuse those issues. If a person can't come to work due to child care issues, essential or not, they may be eligible for FFCRA leave and you're gonna to need to go through the analysis whether the FFCRA applies to you if this employee is eligible and get the certification. Um, we've gotten a number of questions about the PPP and, and Mark, we may lean on you a little bit here, but one of the issues was that people got money and then there was a big hue and cry because some publicly funded companies got money and they, and they were well funded. So the, the DOL came out and actually created a safe harbor that allows people to return the money up until May 14th if they have other access to uh, uh, liquid, liquid funds and the like. Now, it's so broad, it's hard to know. I, I have a client that, uh, that told us, well, I could go take loans and do all this, um, but I, and I could, I could uh, run for about four months and then I'd be highly in debt and could be out of business. So, but should I be giving my PPP money back? And uh, we've been waiting for some guidance on this and we thought that they extended the May 7th deadline to the 14th, so there would be some guidance, uh, but to date, uh, you know, nothing's come out. So, um, so we don't really have an answer for you uh, on that. But I think if they're going to start prosecuting people who are just trying to keep their business alive, then uh, then they're going to be prosecuting most of the people that ha have taken PPP funds. Mark, did you want to add to that? I, I would just add that I'm, I'm looking at the rule right now, and they specifically say, and I, I gave you're completely right. We're waiting on guidance. We need the guidance. Uh, but they specifically say the guidance is going to come out before May 14th. I mean, we're, we're two days away. So if you're in that, if you're in that situation where you're well, determining whether or not you have to return the money or not, really keep your eyes peeled to the Treasury website where they're releasing all this guidance, because um, it could come out today, could come out tomorrow, could come out May 14th. I, I mean, they've been, you know, kind of uh, willy nilly with their deadlines lately for the PPP. So really, just keep an eye on it. Uh, if that's a concern for you. All right, well, we had one person write in, are there additional considerations for addressing employees' performance issues during the COVID emergency if the issues were documented prior to the shutdown? We've actually had a lot of calls of this nature. You know, I've got an employee, they were not performing well. I was thinking of terminating them. COVID hit, can I still terminate them? And it's the same analysis we do in any termination situation, do you have a legitimate, non-discriminatory and non-retaliatory reason for termination? And is it backed up by the evidence? So a person goes out on FFCRA leave and they're immediately terminated, supposedly due to lousy performance, but you never documented that performance before and you never sent anything to them before. Would that employee probably be able to find a lawyer who would go into court, as Sam says, you can still file complaints? They might. So these are the situations where, when consulting on terminations, we always go through the same exercise with, with you folks when you call on these issues. We look at whether there's a contract, whether it's a collective bargaining agreement or an offer letter. We look at the timing. We look at the person in protected classes and whether you're treating them the same as similarly situated individuals. But ultimately, nothing in due to COVID changes at will status, provided you have an offer letter that says they're at will. So um, consult with counsel on these issues. You're right to be more hip to it. And of course, you want to try to do things in a way, be, but don't, as Jeanette says, don't make promises about unemployment. Don't say, well, we were gonna fire you for poor performance, but we'll say it was due to COVID so you can get an extra 600. Very dangerous, very dangerous because um, the DUA is seeing a lot of fraud and abuse and there may be a crackdown in the future. We had another great question that I, I'm sure a lot of you may be w wondering about. What is the standard or rules to protect the employer against a lawsuit filed by an employee or an employee's family that believe they contracted the virus at the workplace and they are alleging some negligence on uh, the employer's part? And the, the, the question goes on and asks about guidelines on temperature taking, mand mandatory, voluntary. And I think uh, that uh, Julia covered that beautifully. but. As to the first part, I think as employers, if you look to the CDC guidance, if you look to the guidance of your local uh, um, health uh, department, and if you're following 
uh, Governor Baker's rules, I think that's the standard you're going to be held to. So, um, you know, the idea is really we want to protect our employees and that's the guidance out there that suggests how to do it. And so if you follow that as an employer, it's going to be hard for somebody to show that you were negligent in those situations. Now, people can always sue, but if, you, if you're following those uh, guidelines, you're probably going to be in, in pretty good shape. Now, we, I think we have reviewed, oh, there was one, um, Dave, did we get, if we rent an office in a Boston office building, what safety and cleanliness assurances do we need to obtain from our landlord on behalf of our employees before we open? And we were having fun as a panel discussing this, this question before we got on, and Jeff Hirsch, our OSHA expert, reminded us all that you, the employer, have the duty to provide a safe workplace. And then we heard from Allie about contracts. So it may be that certain duties with respect to your facility, you can go to the landlord and say, it's your responsibility to take care of this, but you, the employer, ultimately need to make sure that it happens. Um, so that's a specific, a contract specific question. But the, um, the, uh, our governor came out with some initial guidance yesterday just in terms of, hey, someone has tested positive, you need to do deep cleaning. There's, uh, I, we, our own landlord said something about it, but the elevators and everybody standing in the corner. So you wanna work cooperatively with your landlord to get as much safety measures in place. I think I wanna just take this moment to, we're getting a lot of questions lately about reopening and what should we do for reopening? And here's the way, a, a way we try to think about it is start with what does my state say about reopening? And remember that our state has issued this, this guidances for certain types of businesses like nursing homes. There's guidances for essential businesses. There's guidances for non-essential. So you have to go through what does the state require? Then what do the feds require? Look at the CDC, the OSHA website. Then your own general duty, as Jeff Hirsch says, to provide a safe workplace. Um, some very large clients are actually hiring epidemiologists. Others are, are relying on information that's available. So we have assisted clients in coming up with practical guidance, but each business's return to work plan is going to be a unique thing. And there is certainly still some controversy about lots of issues. Like if I'm outside and I'm six feet away, do I still need to wear a mask? There's controversy on those issues. If I'm inside and I'm behind plexiglass and I'm wearing a mask, can I still get COVID-19 because there's someone next to me that's coughing and sneezing and it's in the air? We don't have clear answers. So hopefully more answers will be coming. I'd invite anybody else on the panel to, to comment on this difficult, time-sensitive question. All right. Hearing none. Now, if you, um, we, we don't have any more questions on the chat. There were others that were posed earlier to all of the panelists, but we'd have to scroll way up. And so if folks didn't have their question answered already in the chat, please send a chat now to all panelists and attendees with your question because we still have a little bit more time. Oh, actually, we don't. It's 928. So, oh, Kathy, may I, may I just jump in one second on a footnote from what Dave said about in, uh, you know, contracting COVID-19 at work? And, you know, like most states, Massachusetts, uh, Chapter 152, our workers' compensation statute, has is the exclusive remedy for workplace injuries and accidents and illnesses. And so there will, there will be a question about whether this was really, you know, something that was special in the workplace or if, you know, there's always an issue relating to, you know, for example, you know, first responders, healthcare workers, direct care workers, uh, in situations where they're having contact with, even supermarket work, workers, where they're having contact with many people who may be positive, may be asymptomatic, those are likely to be potentially work-related. Um, there may also be issues relating to uh, causation. Uh, how, do you sh how can you prove where you caught the, the disease? So these are gonna be, again, very fact specific, but my suggestion would be that uh, you consult your workers' compensation carrier and broker, and uh, it would be an appropriate and prudent thing if you have any issue or question 
or possibility that it was work-related to file the first report of accident or illness and also to include this potentially on the worker on the OSHA 300 log. So there's a, if it's work-related, it should be reported to uh, your carrier and also documented on the OSHA 300 log. Brent, we are pretty much out of time. We've had some questions about whether we can share the chat. We'll need to discuss that because the chat is off the cuff answers and there was also some internal chat amongst ourselves. So um, we'll, we'll make a determination on that, but folks will receive the PowerPoint and you can pick up the phone and call any of us if you have a specific question and that will also even be better because we'll be able to drill down about your specific situation and make sure that the quickie answer really does apply based on your industry, your state, your number of employees. Um, thanks to everybody for participating in our roundtable. And thanks to our panelists for, uh, for their great work. And thanks to Aaron Larson, who made this all happen. Um, everybody have a great day. Stay safe and stay healthy. And uh, we're here if you need us. Thank you.